experience to, to, to relive the life through the eyes of an ancestor. People started telling me like, your dad was really phenomenal. I think people should know the story. And I, it's, it's, it's a part of American history. It makes history seem real. George Washington Carver, Martin Luther King Jr., Marian Anderson, Madam C.J. Walker. These are the names of African Americans whose accomplishments are well documented. We are not going to talk about them tonight, but we are going to focus on the lesser knowns. Those whose accomplishments may not be as celebrated, but who still made significant impacts on American culture. And some of them are right in your backyard. Now, from Wayne 15, Indiana's Hidden History, honoring the celebration of Black History Month. Here's your host, Tara Brantley. Good evening, thanks for joining us. Some of you have asked why Wayne 15 does this special. We do it because for a long time, the history and accomplishments of African Americans were largely left out of history books. As our nation has evolved, we have come together to recognize a month that celebrates diversity and community service. And some who paved the way will be featured tonight. We begin with a Fort Wayne veteran who comes from a long line of freedom fighters. In fact, he has revolutionary roots that he learned about right here at the Allen County Public Library. Most of my life was, was full of, of challenges but opportunities, and the goal is to turn those challenges into opportunities. And that's what Dr. Al Brothers did. Initially went through our Air Force ROTC at Boston University, and then from uh, the Air Force ROTC program into pilot training. This former Air Force captain and son of a World War II veteran was a pilot in the Vietnam War. So I was there between 1970 and 1972 flying B-52s and then B-57s. I was one of the youngest aircraft commanders at the time flying B-52s. He has shared his Vietnam memories with many, including this interview with PBS 39, Fort Wayne's public television station. I'm one of the few guys that uh, had to do manual refueling in a B-52. That's the B-57G, yeah? Recently, this 76-year-old shared those memories and more with me at the Allen County Public Library. The Air Force retiree moved to Fort Wayne from Massachusetts and became an engineer for a company now called Raytheon. It's here where he rose to what you could call a revolutionary challenge. It was a challenge at Raytheon. We have a diversity committee and everything else, and they wanted the, uh, more information about African Americans in, in the military. So my challenge was in 30 minutes to try to give a brief synopsis of African Americans all the way from, from the uh, Revolutionary War all the way up to, through World War II. That brief project led to extensive research at the library's genealogy center, and Brothers uncovered a long line of his relatives dating back to the Revolutionary War before America got her stars and stripes. How many did you have in the Revolutionary War and how many in the Civil War? I had War? two in the, in the Revolutionary War and 31 in, in, in the Civil War. And all the 31 were, were freeborn and uh, li living in, in, in New England. All of them were on my grandmother's side, mm -hmm. and then that's on, on my father's side. And um, her family were the ones that were really in involved. The 54th and the Massachusetts 55th and the 5th Colored Cavalry out of Massachusetts, all three of them. The Academy Award-winning movie Glory told the story of the 54th. The movie Glory was an interesting one, but uh, it gave a, a slightly false impression. When I saw Glory, I thought that the 54th was wiped out. Only 200 men were killed in the 54th. Brothers' relatives were among them. And they went through so much you know, in, in their lives, and their lives are so beautiful. Like Brothers, I also utilize the resources here at the Genealogy Center. Through a DNA program the library hosted in the summer of 2018 in Fort Wayne, I learned my great-great-grandfather on my father's side also fought in the Civil War. Your second great-grandfather, Robert Reedus, was born into slavery grabbed his chance and fought for the Union in the 110th United States Colored Troops. Ended up essentially giving his life in that battle, being taken prisoner, contracting tuberculosis, and not living long after the war. It took months for a team of genealogists to trace my heritage. For Brothers, it's still going on. In addition to researching his heritage, he now helps others trace theirs, teaching a class offered by the Midwest African American Genealogy Institute in partnership with the Allen County Public Library. It covers the gamut from DNA 
doing military research to doing uh, all kinds of research relative to your family. Al Brothers revealing hidden history and finding his place in it. Take a look and see what, what did your ancestors do? What if it's here in the United States or someplace else? Because it gives you a better understanding of who you are because they help uh, build a background for who you came to be. Brothers will hold his next class this summer. You can find a link to get more information by going to this story on Wayne.com. Simply click on Hidden History. Coming up, Fort Wayne's connection to the Underground Railroad. Indiana's Hidden History is brought to you by the Cuesta Education Foundation. Indiana's Hidden History continues. Now here's your host, Tara Brantley. Fort Wayne was once a big railroad town in more ways than one. More than 200 years ago, in addition to standard train travel, there was a different kind of railway that helped African-American slaves on the road to freedom. And this house was part of it. Local historians put us on track with the Underground Railroad. This house, which is two houses put together into one, was the home of the Reverend Alexander Rankin, who was an abolitionist and um, probably an activist on the Underground Railway in the early 1800s in Fort Wayne, Indiana and Ohio. He came from an abolitionist family, his wife came from an abolitionist family, and he was a key part of the anti-slavery movement of that time. He was hired to be the um, pastor of the then very new First Presbyterian Church. He was hired in 1830 to come here. There's conversation about how there's this half wall in the basement and it could have been, you know, easy to hide people there. I can't say, look you in the eye and say, yes, people were hidden in this house and they moved through. But I can say that Levi Coffin, who through the Richmond area is, is Indiana's most well-known underground railway operator, it has been quoted as saying that there were times when he recommended that people who were being led on the railway to safety, he recommended they come through Fort Wayne because he believed that was the safest route at the time. Alexander T. Rankin House is the only standing structure in Fort Wayne that is known to be connected to the abolitionist movement or to the Underground Railroad and that retains the integrity and the historical significance that to show what it really looked like then. We even have the map that shows Fort Wayne in 1850, which is still the time when all of this was very current, with this structure located on it. You can come here and you can see for real what it was like. It makes history seem real. Instead of just hearing about it or reading about it, you can see this house for yourself by contacting Fort Wayne's Arch. You'll find contact information in this story on Wayne.com. Simply go to Hidden History. Coming up, the Fort Wayne face that changed the face of football. Yes, Tara, this is the story of triumph in the face of adversity. I revealed the life-changing legacy of a local football Hall of Famer who defied the odds when Hidden History continues. Indiana's Hidden History is brought to you by the Cuesta Education Foundation. Indiana's Hidden History continues. Now here's your host, Kaitor K. The journey that changed football forever started with one player who walked these hallways, what was then Central High School in Fort Wayne, Indiana. A brutal racist attack on the gridiron that will secure the safety of all future athletes. His body had been criminalized in a sport he was playing that he loved. It was a blindside, cheap shot. I've, it's one of the dirtiest plays I've ever seen. When you see those pictures in that context, it's hard to believe that that could happen, but it did. A gridiron in Oklahoma 1951. It's like the racial injustice just comes to life. A battleground that still haunts Deanie Bright Johnson nearly 70 years later. Nightmares of her dad, the best college football player in the country with a broken jaw and zero sympathy from the stands. 
people just, oh, that's the way it is, that's the way we play football. I mean, that's, that's, that's a terrible, terrible situation. Johnny Bright, Drake University superstar, Bright had been the first black player ever to step in this stadium. On this visit, opponent Wilbank Smith wanted to make sure he'd never come back. I was in the press box at the time, and two or three plays, I said, boy, they're really getting after John, you know. He was watching his teammate run the ball, so he let his guards down just for a moment. Then, a devastating blow to his exposed, unprotected face. Moments later, a second strike, and then a third. But before his team carried his limp body off the field, he launched a statement 61-yard touchdown pass, ready to be the face that changed the safety of the game forever. The best way to retaliate is to be great. And that's a page that you could take from Johnny Bright. A lifetime of leaving witnesses in awe. And you couldn't beat him. It was unbelievable. He moved like a cat. I can remember getting, trying to tackle him, and he had those long legs and those knees hit me. I can still feel that yet. My head going back. He was hard to bring down. And here is Johnny Bright putting 14 yards into the statistics. Johnny Bright's legend took off in Fort Wayne, Indiana, from Central High School Phenom all the way to the Canadian Football Hall of Fame, schools, awards, and stadiums inspired by his name. My dad would say football, sports is the vehicle. His love and his passion was educating people. On the true spirit of a champion, Oh my gosh. Oh, wow. I have never seen this. I mean, I haven't seen this jersey. Number 24, Edmonton Eskimos. Oh my gosh. You know, even though my dad isn't with me anymore, when I've needed a, a booster encouragement and my dad comes through for me. Thank you so much. And her dad comes through for all of us. Every time we see a football helmet, right after the attacks on him in Oklahoma, a national conversation on player safety fired up. The NCAA would soon require all players in the league to wear face masks. As the discussion grew, the NFL would make the same requirement several years later, making Bright's impact on this global game undeniable. Right runs wild for the goal line, and the Eskimos are back in the lead. I mean, the biggest thing, like with football, is that you know it is it's under attack with concussions. I mean, you got to be kind of borderline crazy to run out there with this plastic helmet and no face mask. You know, it has to truly be a love for the game. Where now, you know, our kids are, you know, they're 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 more safe. They're taught proper fundamentals as far as tackling, as far as how to take contact, how to land. And then, you know, with the addition of the face mask, you know, thanks to Johnny Bright, I mean, our game is much safer. What would your dad say if he could see all the players wearing face masks today? He would say it's absolutely amazing. He'd probably have tears in his eyes and say, you know what, we've really come a long way. Oklahoma State University gave the Bright family a formal apology two decades after he passed away, 55 years after the incident. Tara's back to reveal more hidden history after the break. Indiana's hidden history continues, honoring the celebration of Black History Month. Now, here's your host, Tara Brantley. 
A museum in Washington, D.C. is showcasing the hidden history of law enforcement's first African-American sheriff since Reconstruction. Bree Jackson reports on the significant role he played in improving public safety and bridging what was once a huge racial divide. This badge, these sunglasses, and this nameplate belong to a pioneer in law enforcement and civil rights. Lucius Amerson was the first African-American sheriff elected in the Deep South since Reconstruction. Before that, a, a largely African-American population in Macon County was not able to vote for their sheriff. Rebecca Looney is director of exhibits and programs at the National Law Enforcement Museum. She says Amerson was an Army veteran who became sheriff of Macon County, Alabama in the late 1960s following the passage of the Voting Rights Act. She says many saw his election as a sign of progress for black Americans fighting for equality and against police brutality. It's a big step forward. I mean, we say that law enforcement um, needs to reflect our community. Lucius Amerson's story represents a defining moment in law enforcement history. Today, police departments nationwide acknowledge that maintaining and recruiting a diverse workforce is still a challenge. Recent headlines have focused on the Black Lives Matter movement and the lack of trust between police and the public. Craig Floyd, CEO of the National Law Enforcement Memorial Fund, says he hopes the museum can play a part in easing those tensions. We're going to have thoughtful, important conversations between the public and law enforcement. The museum hopes sharing the stories of Sheriff Lucius Amerson, as well as the stories of men and women of all races, who have given their lives in the line of duty will help visitors better understand the vital role diversity plays in keeping our communities safe. In Washington, Bree Jackson. Indiana's hidden history celebrating Black History Month continues after the break. Indiana's hidden history continues. Now here's your host, Tara Brantley. Decades ago, Indiana attracted some of the greatest jazz musicians in the world. Alexa Green looks at the rich history of the Indianapolis jazz scene on Indiana Avenue. Legends like Wes Montgomery or J.J. Johnson may have performed all across the country back in the day, but it was here in the Circle City where they got their big break. The band members would travel through Indianapolis and play here, and then they, they would stay. They knew this was the spot. They wouldn't go to New York. During the 30s and 40s, the avenue was the place to be, lined with dozens of African-American businesses, clubs, and restaurants. The music made during that time quickly caught on. To me, it's a spiritual thing to me. I mean, I can listen to Indiana Avenue and Indianapolis jazz greats, and I can distinguish their sound from somebody in Kansas City or New York. By the 1950s, the neighborhood had drastically changed. Many of the original clubs had shut down and parts of the avenue fell into disrepair. Today, the avenue looks much different, but some of the sounds that first originated there can still be heard throughout the area. Now, I think there's been like a big resurgence in, in music, and I think jazz has been a, a big part of that. On weekend nights, Dixon and others take their talents to the stage, bringing back the music that captured the hearts of so many for so long. Jazz is really special because it's something that is a, a, a true American art form. It came from America, it's very unique, dude. and around the world, people play it and try to emulate what we do here. Cool. Yeah. And now on a more subdued note, we're going to wrap up our show. All of the hidden history stories you saw tonight and more, you can find on our website, wayne.com. Just go to the News tab and click on Hidden History. I'm Tara Brantley. Thanks for joining us. Have a good night.